Hi guys, um, today I've got Vinyl here and um, she's going to join us as I read to you The Peddler's Gift. So um, it is already attached in a PDF for you if you want to click and follow along with that or if you've already got it printed out you can follow along with me but it's important that you're looking at the words while I'm reading through the text. So you can go and click on it, download it and have it open in another tab and just have me kind of talking to you out loud in another tab, okay? So um, The Peddler's Gift is a story um, in the early 1900s and um, Kornkova is the town in Russia that it takes place in. Now that's a fake town, but there's lots of other towns that I'll refer to in the story as I'm reading that actually were true. So a little historical fiction as we read here today. All right, guys, um, so um, go ahead and follow along with your eyeballs as I read aloud. In Kornkova, late summer was hot and damp. The rye grew high as corn. The air smelled of fallen plums, and near our thatched roof hut, the river babbled all day like a happy baby. But in all this warm summer beauty, there was little time for play. From sunrise to sunset, we boys studied Torah, which is the Hebrew Bible, the first five books. And after that, it was supper, prayers, and bed on Shabbos, which is the um, Sabbath day, um, the day of rest. We rested and strolled through the plum orchards at the edge of the village. Only on Wednesday, when our school let out early, did we get a chance to run, yell, play Cossacks, and swish our bare feet in tickle cold waters of the river. One Wednesday afternoon, my friend Moshi and I were making swords from fallen oak branches when he asked, Labush, have you seen Schnuck? What? I cried. Is Schnuck here? Sure. He arrived from Pinsk last night and slept in the synagogue. Yankel saw his wagon there this morning. Maybe he'll come to our house again, I yelled, jumping up. Maybe he's there now. Grabbing my sword, I ran up the riverbank toward home. Every, every peddler who happened through our village brought merriment, but Schnuck brought more laughs than any of them. Lucky me, there at the side of the hut was his broken down cart. I opened the door and saw my father and the peddler sitting at our table, drinking glasses of tea. Standing between them, my mother cut two large slices of her honey cake. The peddler chewed the, ca chewed the cake slowly. His face was thin and dry, and his hands were bony and rough from driving his wagon. His smile was warm, yet he spoke so little my father once said his words must be weighed, not counted. Shimon was the peddler's real name, but because he seemed a simpleton, the children of Kornikova called him Schnook. Now Schnook stood up and in his meek voice said, Please come and see what I have. As I edged closer, he glanced at me and smiled at my father. Your boy has grown taller, he said. Yes, Papa beamed. In summer, Labu shoots up like a wildflower. Schnuck smiled at me for several moments, and despite my feeling that he must be noodle-headed, I smiled back. Some of the older boys said Schnuck was not just simple, but bad. They believed he'd been put under a spell by the evil eye. And that's why he bungled things. Yankel even said Schnuck had magic powers and could use certain words to trick you, make you forget your name, cause feathers to sprout from your ears, and little stewing onions to grow from between your toes. I didn't know what to believe. Papa had many times warned me against gossip. He told me what I didn't see with my eyes, not to make up with my mouth. And yet surely this peddler from Pinsk was cut from a different cloth than the other peddlers who traveled through our village. Other peddlers opened their great bags with flourish, waving their arms and smiling like fathers at weddings as de they described their way wares in long, flowery words. Good Jewish wife, they would explain. They would exclaim, allow me to please show you the most excellent of stew pots. Here I have just for your inspection, direct from the fiery kilns of St. Petersburg, the silver-toned tin pot fit for a fat goose the banquet of the Tsar, May a thunderbolt strike his head. After noisy bargaining, other peddlers would stay for a glass of tea, and then another, a cookie, a slice of honey cake, and more often than not, a supper of soup and groats, which is um, you know, like a kernel of like a grain dish. And when the oil lamps were lit, these peddlers who drove from Moscow to Minsk woke tales of intrigue about the Tsar's court. 
The whole world lay on their tongues. They brought news from Kiev and Vladivostok. They described the fashions of the cities to the merriment of the women, all while pinching the cheeks of the youngest children and slipping cinnamon candies into their small hands. But Schnook was different. The villagers said if Schnook sold coffins, people would stop dying. The truth was, nothing he did turned out right. One time, he left his goods in Pinsk and traveled to Rovno with an empty bag. Another time, he left his bag open near a kitchen door where a goat was tied up. The goat ate five pairs of socks and a hat. Still another time, he sold his wares to himself and gave him to a poor family. Gave them to a poor family. There's a saying, when a foolish buyer goes to market, the sellers rejoice. But in Korinkova, when Schnook the peddler arrived, the buyers rejoiced. If someone actually expressed interest in his goods, he might exclaim, No, nah, you really want to buy these handkerchiefs? The cloth is thin and the stitching poor. It's better to keep your money. Worse yet, Schnook had no idea how to buy goods from the wholesalers. He would often end up with such odd things he didn't know what they were. Once he had mistakenly sold shoehorns as spatulas, and another time he bought 300 fountain pens, all of them leaking. Schnook had such bad luck, people joked even his fountain pens cry. Now, as we all watched, he opened his ragged leather bag. He took his goods out so silently, you would have thought he was hiding them rather than presenting them for sale. He carefully laid out red silk ribbons, boxes of matches, small glass of bottles of rose water, great flag-sized square of cloth, embroidered pillowcases, painted wooden spoons, writing paper and jars of black ink, bone and wooden buttons, paper-wrapped packages of needles, brass button hooks, pure white cakes of soap nesting in blue tissue, and lace tablecloths all the way from Hungary. When he came to the religious items, he showed special care. On the table, he gently placed Shabbos spread covers, prayer shawls, Shabbos candles, and my favorite, the four-sided Hanukkah tops we call dreidels. Schnook's dreidels were big. They were fist-sized, hand-carved from birch wood, could spin nearly three minutes without falling. We gazed wide-eyed at the glorious new things that transformed our soot-stained hut into a colorful bazaar. Even Papa, who took little notice of such things, looked amazed. The peddler stood back and stared down at his boots, as if discovering two old friends. He always seemed shy when showing his goods, so waited for my mother to make the first move. My mother never wished to see him discomfort, began looking over the goods, touching many of them gently, thinking to herself about each one. I watched while she stroked the heavy cotton fabric of the Zeitemer, whose deep blue, the color of corn flowers, I knew my mother would have loved to buy it, loved, dearly loved to buy it, to sew it, to dress me like a scholar. We were not from that sort of thing. My trousers were made for my father's old ones. My shirt was cut from Mama's discarded dress. Even my jacket who lived a former life was Uncle Solly's coat. Mama never had more to spend than a ruble, which is the main unit of money in Russia, rubles. And the time she chose matches, writing paper, and the Shabbat candle. When she'd selected her purchases, she asked how much they cost. And the magic was that the peddler always said, one ruble. Mama sighed and handed Schnook the ruble. It was then, while he was waiting, or while he was writing out the receipt, I noticed one of the dreidels under the chair. As he gathered his wares, he did not see the fallen dreidel. I should have picked it up for him, but something inside me froze. I stood in front of the chair, reasoning frank frantically, he won't miss it. After all, he never notices anything. Besides, I'll just borrow it, and the next time he comes to town, I'll find a way to slip it back to him. Just then, my father's voice interrupted my thoughts. Shyman, the sky is dark and the air is heavy. Would you, we would be honored if you would share our supper with us and stay the night. As always, Schnook made an excuse to go. Thank you, but Pinsk is still two days away, and I want to get there by shadows. But Shyman, my mother asked, where will you go if it rains? Peddler opened the door. This is my shelter, he said. My carpet is the road my ceiling, the sky, my lamps, the stars. 
That night after prayers, I climbed onto my bed above the warm brick oven and listened to the crashing sounds of the late summer storm. I had hidden the dreidel under my feather bed, and now I took it out to feel it smooth and wood in the dark. My parents had fallen asleep quickly, but I could not sleep. A thief has, they say, a thief has an easy job, but difficult dreams. My mind spun like a dreidel as I imagined being in jail, laughed at and scorned. There is Labush, the thief, the thief, the thief. I saw my father, my mother, the rabbi, all the villagers pointing at me while the dreidel burned in my hand. Outside the rain pounded as if it were crying for me, while nightmarish images stormed through my head. And suddenly I saw the trusting face of the peddler and realized with terrible certainty that I had done wrong. In the dark, I laced up my boots and put on my coat, tucking the dreidel into my pocket. I slipped out into the ring. I ran through the village, heading for the synagogue, and for I hoped if Schnuck would be in any dry place tonight, he would be there. The night was wild. In the black sky, ghostly clouds traveled quickly across the heavens. The wind howled like a dog in pain, and the rain beat down so angrily the twisted cobblestone streets were changed into rivers. Lights were on in the synagogue. I peeked through the side window, but it streamed with rain. I could see only someone's shadow. I went to the door and found it slightly opened. I had straightened my mind that I was going to say to him. I would confess my sin right away and give back the dreidel. Then I would ask him to forgive me. I trembled as I entered the synagogue, partly from the cold, but mostly from fear. An oil lamp burned brightly. I walked in, the rain dripping off me, forming brightly, forming small puddles on the floor. Suddenly, I heard singing in a voice so strong and beautiful, I couldn't move. The peddler was not here, someone else. Some powerful voice traveler had sought shelter in the synagogue tonight. My disappointment so great, I began to cry. The man broke off his splendid song and walked toward me. His face was bright with such happiness that at first I did not recognize him. Laibush, he said, what are you doing here on this terrible night? His words startled me. For a few horrible seconds, I had forgotten why I was there, and I could do nothing but cry. At last, my tears stopped, and I said through chattering teeth, I came to bring this to you. You left it in my home. I handed him the dreidel. I mean, I stole it. Schnuck pulled a handkerchief from his pocket and wiped my face. Come, he beckoned, getting me dry clothes from his valise. Change your clothes. And I had changed. The storm was still raging, so Schnuck and I remained in the synagogue until it passed. He wrapped himself in his coat and made me sleep on his feather quilt. As we bedded down, I said, I'm sorry, I took your dreidel. I know you are, was all he replied. But why aren't you angry with me? I asked. He looked at me for a few seconds, smoothing his beard. First of all, he said with a small smile, I knew you had taken it. You knew? I saw you put it in your pocket. Thank the Lord, you're not a good thief. You knew and you're still not angry? Why aren't you angry? For some reason, my own voice had anger in it. We're in the Lord's house. This is too much peace here to be angry. You were angry at yourself. That's what's really what mattered. The peddler pulled the coat tighter around him. He was too short to cover his feet and I saw his worn socks dotted with holes. When we woke, it was still dark. After dressing and praying, he hitched Fresser to his cart and said goodbye. In that gray, dead world that exists before dawn, I watched the peddler steer his old cart down the mud wash road toward Pink Pinsk. I turned homeward. My sleeping village lay cold and wet around me, giving off the odor of damp wood and musty hay. I reached home before my parents woke and climbed back into bed. Into bed. Though he returned to Kornkova for many years, I never again called him Schnuck. He was Shyman, the peddler from Pinsk. Shyman the wise, the strong, the kind. The one who left cotton the color of cornflower by our door. And on Hanukkah, a big birch carved dreidel. I have it to this day. On snowy Hanukkah nights, when the candles burnt short and the dreidel spins its lone path across the landscape of our floor, I see him traveling to Pinsk. His carpet the road, his ceiling the sky, and his lamps the stars. Alright guys, I hope that you enjoyed the peddler's gift. You can hit next and head on to that discussion board. Thanks.